consider a very rare type of forgetting, amnesia. There are two varieties, anterior grade and retrograde. This often poses great trouble for students to learn, but try to tackle it this way. I think you'll find it very effective. If I ask most students, what does retro mean? They'll say old. Exactly. So amnesia is all about forgetting. If a person has a retrograde type, they can't remember the old information. And if retro means old, you might be tempted to say the anterior grade means new and you would be correct. In that one, you cannot remember the newer information. So next, when that settles okay, consider the example of HM who we discussed earlier in the course and see if you can fill in those four blanks associated with the answer, or I'm sorry, with the question. Unfortunately for HM, he had a brain structure that was regularly short-circuiting, resulting in many, many, many seizures every day. So he had his hippocampus removed because of his bad epilepsy or bad seizures. And afterwards, he could no longer learn the new stuff. And let's see, retro was old, so it's not the old stuff. So that had to be the new term for us, the anterior grade. So anterior grade amnesia. Hopefully you did okay on that. It's very unlikely that if you can't remember something, it was due to amnesia. In general, our inability to remember is caused by failure in either the way you encoded it, stored it, or retrieved it. Next, see if you can identify what should go in those three blanks you are now looking at. Actually, go ahead and do it. So in general, when we have a problem in memory, it's not because we had amnesia. Our problem is much more likely to be to a failure in the way we encoded the information, stored it, or in the retrieval process itself. Many people believe that memory works like a cell phone or a camera. It purpose. Many people who have not taken a psychology course believe that memory works rather like a camera or a cell phone and that it perfectly preserves the image or the audio material. Uh, that is far, far from the case. Memory is constructive in its process, uh, hence the picture I chose. Every time that you try to retrieve a memory, it has to be reconstructed. And that creates a lot of room for errors in the reconstruction process. Interference is another reason why we can sometimes fail to retrieve information. Old knowledge can interfere with the learning of new knowledge, or sometimes vice versa. Perhaps you learn one language in high school and are trying to learn a new language in college. Uh, perhaps you learned Spanish in high school and now are attempting French. Some students find that their knowledge of their Spanish remains strong, but it's exceedingly difficult for them to learn French. Other students learn the new language French very readily, but have difficulty recalling Spanish, things that were quite easy before they attempted French. So interference can affect us in various subject areas, not only just in language learning. Retrieval has been well studied, and we know that certain factors can either facilitate it or inhibit it. Let's consider the two factors of context and mood. We know that context has a strong effect. We remember better when we are in the same situation as when we first learned the information. Similarly for mood, we remember when we're in the same mood as when we first learned it. Now at test, I would not be so kind to use context and context for mood and mood, so I would use a synonym. So maybe perhaps a moment, consider a different way of saying the word context. So when we're in the same context, how else could you say it? Maybe setting, uh, maybe environment. Let's consider now mood. How could we say mood differently? Uh, perhaps the same emotional state. 
a very long time ago when I was an undergraduate. I was a passenger in my friend's car, and she had a fairly large tree going like maybe 40 miles an hour. Afterwards, we were sitting there, and I was a little foggy since my head had hit something. And there was a lot of gas escaping from the engine compartment. All I could think in my days was that whenever you see this on TV, the car always catches on fire, and this was not the way I want to go out. So I was highly motivated to get out of the car as quickly as I possibly could. And if you think about it, what way would you think I would have exited? If you said using the door did not occur to me, about after a lifetime of going out through cars 100% of the time through doors and 0% of the time through windows, I rolled down the window, broken hand, flew out the window, broken foot, never having even considered trying the door, which, by the way, was just fine. So you can see this is a very good example of mood-dependent uh, interference or forgetting. A mood vastly different than my normal one interfered with the retrieval of the information of how to get out of a car. Let's say that a student is studying their notes for a particular subject. Maybe they're somewhat interested or a tiny bit interested or maybe somewhat disinterested, maybe even bored. Then they go to take their test and let's say that they experience sheer terror. Well, they didn't study in sheer terror, so they probably are not going to recall the information very well at all. Would this be an example of context or mood difficulties? Clearly mood. So either the student could try to study in sheer terror, which I wouldn't recommend, or find ways to calm themselves during testing. Uh, perhaps our uh, student success coaches or a college counselor might be able to give you a lot of assistance in this particular regard. Let's consider an interesting experiment on context-dependent memory. In this study, some of the participants had to memorize words while scuba diving, other students memorized words on the beach. Later on, they were all tested. Some students were tested where they had originally learned the words. Others were tested in a new environment. Not surprisingly, subjects who learned the words under the water recalled more words while underwater. Subjects who learned words on the beach recalled more words while on the beach. A nice, simple, sweet experiment showing context-dependent memory. Let's consider a not too fancy technical term, tip of the tongue, often abbreviated with the acronym TOT. I see this as a frustration primarily. The frustration you experience when you know you know something and you swear it's going to fly to the tip of your tongue any moment. And it often does. A tip though that I found useful, if it really is frustrating you, move on, but remember to go back. If it's that frustrating, your brain will unconsciously still be working on it. So when you return, often you find that the word will be there waiting for you. Hopefully that's helpful. It works for me. Let's consider another early great psychologist, German of course, by the name of Ebbinghaus. And he's associated with the forgetting curve. His method was simple but eloquent. He used himself as the primary subject. Apparently he worked affordably for himself. He had to create words for himself to memorize so he could study his pattern of forgetting. He created stimuli that are often referred to as nonsense words. These words were always made up. Uh, they always had three letters, a vowel in the center, consonants on either side, and were never a word in his native tongue. He would then study them until he had 100% accurate recall, and then he would study the pattern in which he forgot them. And the pattern fell into that J-shaped curve you see graphed out below. He found that the bulk of the forgetting occurred in the very first 24 hours. So if you look between the edge of the chart at the right angle and the two, and then follow that up, you'll see that in the first day, more than half of the forgetting occurred in the first 24 hours. He also wanted to figure out within that first 24 hours, was it more the beginning, middle, end, evenly across it? Well, if you look where it says one hour, you'll see that approximately half of the material had been forgotten in that first hour. So clearly, within that first 24-hour period, the bulk of the forgetting occurs in the very first hour. Now consider after the first day, which is not labeled, so just before two, and followed across all the way to the right, virtually a horizontal line. Virtually no new forgetting after the first day. 
This is applications for your studying. Many students will study for an hour or two, can retain it, and they think that they have learned it sufficiently. Not the case. According to this chart, you would want to go and check yourself 24 hours later. If you know it then, it's looking good. You might just need some light touch-ups every now and then. But many students don't go back to that next day test, and they assume if they know it after an hour or two, that they'll know it for the test, which is, again, often, so often, not the case. Make sure you test yourself 24 hours later. What you know at that point, you know. What you don't know, we'll work on it more. Let's look at some important applications for memory research. Knowing these could actually impact a person's life, could actually mean the difference between life or death. Please go to the link and listen to this short video. Most people believe that if a person confesses, they are guilty, and if it's taken back, they tend to still think the person is guilty. And it does seem logical, but research is clear, both in the area of psychology and criminology. People regularly give false confessions, and we even know what parameters increase the likelihood of false confessions. So please, if you're in a jury, do not think that the person who's confessed is automatically guilty. I think you'll find this video very surprising. On the first day of class on our play quiz, we had a question asking about hypnosis and memory. And many of us are surprised to learn that hypnosis actually does not enhance memory. People will actually recall more information, but the bulk of the information, or at least a scary percentage, is inaccurate. This is a prime reason why we do not hypnotize witnesses in the courtroom for fear of actually altering memory. In one particular experiment on false memories, researchers recruited subjects from a psychology pool. They obtained permission to contact the subject's parents and enforce phone numbers. They then asked the parents if there was ever an episode in which the child was lost more than, say, a minute or two as a child. If they said yes, that particular subject was now out of the study. They only wanted subjects who had no experience of being lost. They then met the subjects again and discussed the episode in which they were lost as a child. The researchers provided many, many details, the same for every subject, of course, and asked the subjects what they remembered about the event. Subjects often claimed that they remembered the events and needed added on to details. As a child, I remember visiting a uncle's lake house one time. I remember dimly telling the adults that there was a bear outside. I remember that the men got their shotguns and went hunting the bear, and they brought the bear back dead. I mentioned that as an adult to my mother, and she laughed and said nothing remotely occurred like that. As much as I can figure, maybe I saw a dog outside, and that was the extent of it. The great Swiss psychologist, Jean Piaget, shared an interesting event from his childhood. He grew up in a family that was comfortable financially and the family had a nanny. One day the nanny brought him home and she was in terrible shape, all scuffed up. She related a story in which kidnappers attempted to steal the young child, but she thwarted them. The family was very grateful and gave her a reward. Years and years later, long after she had left their employment, they received a letter from this employee begging for forgiveness. Apparently she was short on money had contrived the story, made it up, scuffed herself up. And yet, Jean Piaget has distinct memories of this entire kidnapping event that never occurred. So how would he form these memories? Clearly, he had heard the stories year after year being shared to every family guest and family member of the brave uh, nanny and the child that was saved. And he visualized these stories and these stories became transformed and became a memory that he thought was real and his own. So it is likely that all of us have a few memories from childhood 
they were not really memories of the event, but were rather stories that we had heard so many times and visualized that they became a memory that we thought was firsthand and was really just the memory of the retelling. Mnemonics could be defined as memory strategies or memory devices. You've been provided a few throughout the course, such as the hippocampus or ACE for acetylcholine. And sometimes the class will share a particularly good mnemonic that becomes mine and I pass on to future generations. Are there examples that you use in your other classes, perhaps a math class, a uh, music class, perhaps? Let's listen to psychologist Phil Zimbardo teach us the PEG word mnemonic with fellow colleague Gordon Bauer. He'll only give us the pegs for one through five. You'll have to work on the six through 10 on the next slide. Did you notice how after Phil Zimbardo had learned the pegs, how easily and quickly he was able to learn those word pairs and do them backwards. And if you did them with him, you notice that you probably had the same facilitation of behavior. Although the method of peg word mnemonic sounds silly, it is actually quite effective and can be quite useful for students. I'd urge you to give it a try the next time you have to do a certain list of words in order, a certain group of steps in order, whether it's culinary or biology. You might find it very, very useful and might use it throughout your college career.